together. And I also want to introduce, here he is, the Executive uh, Director of the Military Heritage Institute, Noam Mirsky. I, uh, and I don't see him here, but uh, Mike Hakey, the Museum Director, is here somewhere, but he'll be coming in and out, so he will be, uh, 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 he's upstairs now, and he will be stopping by a little later. Uh, I want to also thank the Military uh, Museum and the Institute, other staffs that have worked so hard to uh, get programs going. We are a very new organization, uh, having opened up this museum last October, so you can understand that we, uh, uh, we have a lot of growing pains. I also want to thank the docents that are uh, here. Those are the volunteers that come in every day when we're open. Two docents in the back here. Please recognize those the, the docents over here. <laughs> and you know we we talked about World War II and uh, and we're going through Korea, Vietnam, and all the wars. <clears throat> and as you know, World War II was successful to a large extent by the efforts of the women, the women that were in uh, factories, women that took on the positions of all the men that went into the service, and uh, we all know World War II, Rosie the Riveter. Rosie the Riveter. Hey, come on, let's see. <laughs> Betty Willett. <laughs> and she's a member of the board and a hardworking person that's been with this board for about 12 years. And believe me, she is one true, uh, dedicated individual. The, uh, uh, the book signing after the forum, we'll be over on the right-hand side over there. Looney Fort will be doing signing of, and autographing the books for you that you want to purchase. There are a number of books that are uh, out there. So once we have a break or after the uh, program, step over to the right over there and there will be uh, books available. Now it's for me an honor and a pleasure to introduce an individual that I've known a long time had many, uh, many dealings, and uh, we won't go how far back, I can't say that how far back, but we do go a long ways back. And that is our moderator, uh, Nooney Fort. She was with the U.S. Army Reserve from 1975 until 1997, trained first as a medical records clerk before reclassification to medical supply clerk. After changing units, was reclassified as unit supply clerk, became company supply sergeant, battalion supply sergeant, property book NCO and first sergeant. Heavily involved with property accountability from company through divisional level. Trained personnel at all ranks. Assisted leading division property, loading division property into the first automated system in the country. Retired as a first sergeant in 22 and a half years as an E8, master sergeant spearheaded the successful effort to have entertainment. Martha Ray on it has been interviewed on AE biography, as well as many television radio programs, and had written 10 books. 10 books. I'm working on one now, man. <laughs> she continues to try to pass along women's military and <coughs> history to others. Belongs to the American Legion Post number 1610 in North Albany, also Associate Vietnam Veterans of America, Women's Army Corps Veterans Association, life member of the Tri County Council of Vietnam Era Veterans, as well as belonging to several other veteran and civilian organizations. It's an honor and a pleasure to introduce my good friend, Nuni Ford, and introduce the panel. Told 
me that it was happening and that I got in eh, a couple weeks ago and the opportunity to come up here and tour the place. It's an amazing venture and I know that they have tons more of information to share with not only Saratoga County but New York State residents and hopefully residents from around the world and country will come here. Well, what I'm here today to talk about is the female side of our military and civilian population. We all know about the military men and all that they do because they mostly see the combat side. The women now are getting to see that side of the war also, but they also saw it many years ago. And their stories were seldom told until the past, say, decade, maybe 15 years. And now they're finally starting to open up and really talk about it. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to introduce you to some of these ladies that are here with me. I'm going to ask them a few questions when they come up to the stand. Let them tell you their side of what they accomplished in their military careers. And then we'll have a slideshow. Following that will be a book signing. So before I go any further, I'd like to introduce a couple of these people to you. Since I don't know a couple of them, I need notes. I already grabbed my notes. On my far right is Lieutenant Colonel Francis Liberty, World War II, Korea, Vietnam. I met Colonel Lib hmm, oh, back in the 80s, and we've been friends ever since. She helped me with the Medals for Maggie Committee when we tried to get the Presidential Medal of Freedom for Martha Ray. And she was about the third or fourth person I called when the White House called me and said it was a done deal. So she's been in on that since the get-go. I'm really glad somebody brought her up today and surprised me. I had no idea she was coming today. Next to her, I believe, is Bernadette Jones O'Connor. She enlisted in the Women's Army Corps, 1945, trained at Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia, which, by the way, I finally got to see. Is this still there? The, the <laughs> fort is still there, yes. Uh, went to Kennedy General Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee for medical training. Worked as a surgical technician in the orthopedic ward. She was discharged October of 46 as a T5, better known as a corporal or a technical five. She received the Good Conduct Medal and the World War II Victory Medal. And thanks to the U.S. government, she received her high school diploma in 2002. So give her a good hand for that. I think that's great. And right next to me is Rose Stewart. U.S. Navy, 1953 to 64, self-taught data processing. I haven't figured that part out yet because I don't know data processing for anything. She developed various personnel and inventory systems, received special honors for computer systems involving inventory requirement for aircraft carriers based on estimated sea schedules. That sounds interesting. She established in-house training programs with computer-related topics for the junior enlisted personnel. She taught and was a forms design specialist. I'm lucky I learned how to do a web page. So you're doing fine. <laughs> she belonged to the Navy Reserve from 64 to 75 and established personnel training schedules on a Honeywell computer. I don't even remember a Honeywell computer. <laughs> but I never liked it. She worked with the Navy Air Intelligence in Maryland, reviewing air reconnaissance photos on a computer. Okay, I want to hear about that. She established personnel service and training accounting procedures for reservists at the Floyd Bennett Field Naval Air Station in New York. I hope that's near to Long Island, because I've never heard of it. Oh, it's no longer there. Okay. <laughs> she retired as a da Navy Data Processing Chief E-7 May of 1975. She's a disabled Korea and Vietnam era veteran with 50% disability and belongs to American Legion Post 374 in Lake George. On my far left 
is my pal Terry Waterston. U.S. Marine Corps, 1954, clerical duties at Camp Elmore in Norfolk, good old Virginia. She also worked at the headquarters Marine Corps in Arlington, as well as at Quantico. She has held and continues to hold several positions with the American Legion Post 629 in North Creek. And yes, this is her shirt that I'm wearing, not her shirt, but her post shirt that she was good enough to provide me with. Uh, she continues to belong to the Marine Corps League, the Korean War Veterans Association, and the American Legion, as well as the Legion's Auxiliary. To my immediate left is my pal Pam Waterston, who followed in her mom's work, in her mom's boots. Pam joined the Army, of all things. Thank you very much. What? In 1989, she was trained as a heavy equipment operator, she took part in Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm, Desert Victory. She was in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, August 1990 to May 1991. After active duty, she joined the Army Reserve and served 1991 to June of 2000, where she was reclassified as an engineer and instructor. She was medically discharged as a Sergeant E-5 in June of 2000. She belongs to American Legion Post 629 in North Creek. She's also a life member of the VFW and the DAV. Me, I'm not important. <laughs> I did my time, 22 years worth, and John pretty much gave you a rundown on what I did during that period. We are expecting another lady by the name of Patty Hawks. Hawks, okay, I wasn't sure of the pronunciation. She's from Bolton Landing. Uh, she enlisted in the Navy in 1985 and is still currently serving. She's been stationed in New Orleans, Groton, Connecticut, Newport, Rhode Island, Portsmouth, Virginia, and Bethesda, Maryland. During the Gulf War, she was on board the USHS Comfort, which is a hospital ship. Presently, she is the Ombudsman, I hate Navy terms, <laughs> at the Clinton Falls Naval Reserve Center. As a civilian, she's a full-time nurse in Bolton, and volunteers with the Toys for Tots drive each Christmas. And I look forward to meeting her when she arrives. I would like to ask Colonel Liberty to tell you about part of her career in the United States Army Nurse Corps, which spanned a good part of her life, and she continues to be active. I don't know if this mic will reach down there, will it? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to carry it down to the end. Just squeeze, squeeze the thing underneath the fence. Okay. You can tell I don't use a mic very often. <clears throat> now, before we get started, I'm going to ask a couple questions. Okay. And then you can answer. How's that? All right. Where were you born? Pittsburgh, New York. And where did you live prior to going in the military? I was in Mechanicville, Waterville Age. Went back to Plattsburgh to take my nursing school. And I joined Waterville Age. I joined the military. I thought so. Mm. I just wanted to make sure I remembered right. And you entered the military in 1941? No. 44. And one story I remember Colonel Lip telling me about, because she likes to tell stories, was borrowing a bus and driving around Europe. No, that was Japan. Japan, <laughs> one of those countries. Go out of the officers' club. And the hospital was located about five miles away. So you had to take a bus to get there because they, we weren't allowed private vehicles. So the bus that transported us was sitting in front of the officer's club and the driver was gone and there were a couple of other nurses and a couple of doctors on the bus and I got on the bus and they said, hey, Lib, we bet you can't drive this thing. I said, I bet I can. I backed it up and drove it back to the hospital. Went through the gate, nobody said a word. Parked it in front of the nurse's quarters, went in and went to bed. In the morning, I woke up and went outside my room. 
there's assistant chief nurse out there, and she's just saying, oh my God, you're in trouble. I said, why? She said, you stole a bus. I said, I can't. She said, yes. She said, it's right out there in the front. So I looked out the window, and I said, sure enough. So I got dressed and went over to see the chief nurse. She said to me, why did you do that? I said, it seemed like a good thing to do at the time. I said, we were tired, we wanted to go home, the bus driver wasn't there. So we didn't have any accidents, and we're at the end of the gate. She said, well, look, the transportation officer is furious. So I thought to myself, well, let it be, you know. I, so pretty soon he comes along, I went up to work. He comes along and he starts yelling and ranting up and down the ward and hollering and yelling. And the chief nurse on the ward, I can see her now, her name is Maggie Lapp. A little tiny blonde. She stormed out of her office and up to him and she said to him, You get off my ward and stop annoying my nurses. He said to her, I outrank you, she said, not in this hospital. I'm God. Get out of here. And he left. <laughs> Nurses always did things like that all the time and got away with it because of the rank. Not always. Not always, huh? Now, there was another trip you took, you told me about, in Korea, from one end to the other end, and you happened to run across a short, buxom lady. I was on the hospital trains in Korea, and we uh, went up north, and we picked up the wounded at various uh, mass stations. And let me tell you, MASH is not like what you see on television. It's, what you see on television actually happened, much of it, but all in different stations. What they've done is draw it together to make one story. And uh, that was tough living in Korea. Korea is probably the coldest place you'd ever want to be in your whole life. And I mean bone-chilling cold. And, uh, it was just rough living, and uh, we lived in tents. We had pot-bellied stoves to keep us warm, and the only way you could get warm with that was a bunch of your cluster around it. And we kept hot water on the top of it so that we could breathe. So this one day, I'm going up towards the north to pick up, and this woman got on, and civilian, but she was in fatigues. She introduced herself and she said, I'm Martha Ray. I'd like a ride up north. I'm going to entertain. So I said, your lady, if you're going to entertain these kids, you can ride anywhere with me. So we walked along and when it came time for her to get off, she didn't want to get off. She said to me, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to load up patients. She said, well, I'm going to stay with you for a while. I said, it's going to be a long ride. So I, I said, now I'm going back to Busan to offload most of them. I said, I got unload some of them at the hospital ship the Navy has out here. So she said, okay, I'm going to stay with you. So we offloaded, we unloaded a lot of kids. And God, they were young. 17, 18-year-old. Eight year Marines all shot to hell. And we loaded them up and put them on their litters. We calmed them down as best we could. She was right alongside me. She said, you think it would help if I stayed in one car with some of them? Well, I said, I think it would help immeasurably. She walked around, just touched them, talked to them, told them a joke or something, laughed. Adjusted their bandages a little bit. That's how I'm going. It was very nice to see. She was a nice lady. Do you come from a patriotic family? Yes, I have two brothers. One brother in the Air Force in World War II, and a younger brother who was a Command Sergeant Major who died on active duty in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, 
about 17 years ago. He was our baby. I had him as a patient one time. He um, was coming down north and they loaded patients on. And some of them I didn't see, so I always made rounds to make sure I had all of them. And I knew them, what their injuries were in case I needed to do something. So I got right by this one bed, and I went to turn this kid over, and the sergeant was standing there, and he said, Ma'am, just leave him alone. I'll take care of him. I said, What do you mean? Look at all the wounds. He said, Just leave this guy alone. We'll make sure it's all right. I turned him over. It was my kid brother. I looked down at him, and I said, Oh, my God. He said, what are you doing in a dirty place like this? He said, what are you doing here? He looked up at me and he said, now my name is Francis, but you know all families have nicknames. He said, Frankie, I'm not going to die, am I? I said, God, no, George would kill me. <laughs> he made it, as you can see. And if I remember correctly, you kicked him out of Vietnam. Yes, I did. <laughs> because you outranked him. I was sitting in a officer's motel, hotel overlooking the street and there were four or five of those girls sitting there. I looked out and I, this one girl says to you, you know, babe, if I didn't know better and they didn't know two people in country from the same family, I would say that was your brother. She says he's got both legs just like him. So I looked out and he's coming up the street with two officers and they're walking along chatting and I said, oh my God, that is him. So we ran, I ran down in the street, and we kissed and hugged, you know. One of the officers said to him, what are you doing kissing an officer? And he said, she's my sister. He looked at me and he said, right? And I said, right. <laughs> he said, you have to leave country. We need him here. And my commanding officer said, no, he has to leave country. We really need her here to set up these mass units up north. Bye-bye, Sarge. <laughs> he would call me no matter where I was. I never figured out how he did it and laugh at me because I was over there. And I'd say to him, how the hell do you do this? You know they're shooting at me. <laughs> it's a tough duck. So, and another thing about him, if I was anywhere here in the States and I was teaching a class or something and he was anywhere near or on the post, he would run to the front door where I was getting out. So I'd, he'd have to, I'd have to salute him and he'd laugh at me because he said medical people didn't know how to salute. <laughs> One last question. Can you tell the people what awards you received for your time in service? Oh, I got the Bronze Star. I got the Army Commendation Medal. And I got the Medal for Meritorious Service and some other stuff. Some other stuff. I don't remember it all. My God, I'm almost 80 years old. I don't remember all this stuff. <laughs> Thank you, Colonel Will. Yes, I met Colonel Will back in the 80s. And it wasn't until I happened to go visit her at home, her home, that I found out that she had the Bronze Star, because she sure never told me about it. So I'm really glad I've gotten to know her a little bit more. I don't understand this metal business. I did it. I had a job to do, and I did it. Right. <laughs> the kids that are out on the line deserve the medal. <laughs> True. However, the women deserve them too, as well as those who are up at the front. Bernadette, I'm about to learn some stuff about you because I have no idea. So I'm going to hand you the mic unless you want to stand up and talk. It's your option. Oh, you want to get up? Okay. Thank God. There you go. You already know when I went into service that our training we received, we, it was six weeks, a 
and that covered the entire training that a nurse would get it took. How long does it take a nurse for training? Three years. Three years? We were given, of course, it was just the highlights, but we were able to do everything on a ward that a nurse could do, except for handling narcotics. You make a bed. And here I'll insert a little thing that I did, along with a couple of others. A patient of mine was in a private room. He was in traction with weights, and that was attached to a bulk of frame. If you don't know what a bulk of frame is, it's all this paraphernalia up there that they can attach the police to. Okay, so he went, decided he'd like to have a party. So we contacted the charge nurse. And I'll never forget her. She was one of the most wonderful persons that I've ever met. Her name was Helen Basil. We asked her if we could have a party. And she said, well, if you keep it, keep it quiet. So we went to town with our little shoebox that was empty and brought back our liquor. The MPs didn't check those boxes because we took our shoes into town to be repaired. And the women got away with more bringing liquor in the post than the men did. So anyway, we had our party and I had to leave the room for purposes. And when I came back, the patient was gone. Here, now he's tied up to traction. We couldn't find him. I didn't see him at first. He sat on top of the bulk of the frame and he was crowing like a rooster. Well, Helen came in and that was the end of our party. She says, that's it. That was uh, one of the funny things that happened. Another one, when I was working on the paraplegic ward, we had this, he could have been a football player. He was a big black man. He had both legs amputated, and he was paralyzed from the waist to the stumps of these legs. He was the cheerfulest person I have ever seen. You'd go in there, maybe you didn't get a letter from home for a couple of days, and he could make you laugh always had a smile on his uh, face. And to think of him, and to think of the problems that he had ahead of him, it, it just made you feel very small. I uh, received the World War II Victory Medal and the Good Conduct Medal. I had six brothers that served in the uh, their country. One was in the Marines, one in the Navy, and the rest of them were in the Army. So we really outdid the, the other two. But the brother in the Navy had a very exceptional career. He served in both World War II and the Korean War, and he has enough uh, fruit salad that uh, people wonder how we got them all, but he earned them. We went to Antarctica and we had a bird, and we nearly lost him. We never knew about it until he came home. Several years later, he told us that his ship almost capsized. Uh, let's see. I belong to the American Legion at Hudson Falls, and I've been a member for 25 years. I was Legionnaire of the Year, 1990-91. And then also, I became Legionnaire of the Year in 1998. That was something that was very different from anybody else in our post. Nobody else has ever had that distinction. I was County Legionnaire of the Year in 1998. And I think that's about it. That's a lot. Thank you.
practical nurse? A corpsman. A corpsman? No, uh, Medic? No, a corpsman. Yeah, a corpsman. But, uh, and they were invaluable. <laughs> yeah. You couldn't have done it without them. And one time the uh, ward master said we couldn't do any more of that work because the nurse sat in the office all the time. Well, wow. so <laughs> yes, there are some nurses who sit in the office all the time. Well, anyway, it uh, it didn't help the patients. No, and he must so, have been mad at her for some reason. Yeah, it was. And the one we had one charge nurse that had served overseas. She was just a tiny thing, and behind her back we called her Mammy Yoakum. <laughs> but it wasn't beyond her to pick up a, a cloth and wash down a bed. No. And you know, and she was just a, a wonderful person. You know, have all the beds to clean before anybody else came in again. But we used to have to lock up the aqua velva on the fellows in the orthopedic wards. Oh, yeah. Because they would drink it. And oh, you have never seen anything so funny as four or five fellows drunk on aqua velva <laughs> swinging from these lines. <laughs> <laughs> they would strain it through their uh, denatured alcohol. Mm -hmm. They would strain it through uh, Kleenex. We had, to, we had to lock up the aqua velva and we had their names on them and we gave it to them in the morning. And we marked it. We gave it to them in the morning for them to shave and do their ablutions, and then we'd take it away and look at, check the mark, make sure they hadn't done too much. Well, another thing, if they got a package from home and there was shaving lotion in it, everybody around them in the beds, how much alcohol is it contained? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Bernadette. Now I know a little bit about you. <laughs> And before I leave New York, I'll, I'm going to learn a whole lot more, I hope. Well, it was interesting. I'm glad you I served. served the medical corps had good. two good ladies helping yeah, them out. Had septic cases. Rose Stewart. Yes, ma'am. You want to stand or do you want to sit? I'll stand. All right. I'm going to let Rose tell you her story. I may throw in a few questions along the way. While I know recon and aircraft carriers, I know zip about data processing. Okay. Go for it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm originally from Indianapolis, Indiana, and I was going to Jordan College of Music in 1953 when my dance band decided to go into the service to play in the band, the Navy band. I thought, I'll go in too. Well, after I swore in and everything, they said, um, I'm sorry, women are not allowed to play in the Navy band, but since you were a key punch operator at Western Electric while you were going to school, we'll put you in what we call the data processing or machine accounting in the Navy. And I was so honored. I, I think I probably invented that saying, you step in it and come out smelling like a rose, <laughs> because I was able to meet a wonderful lady called Grace Hopper. And if you've been around uh, computers, you know there's a computer language called COBOL. And she was the inventor of this. I was the other lady in data processing beside Grace uh, Hopper. Um, I didn't get the fame she did because I didn't do the thing she did. But it gave me an opportunity to learn computers at the very beginning. So when I got off of active duty, decided to stay in the reserve, I went to the bank, bank, uh, bank of New York begging them to let me, you know, get a job there in the systems analyst area. And they said, well, do you have any experience in computers? I said, well, I spent 11 years on active duty in a machine accounting, computer data processing with Grace. And so I got hired right away. And I was on I was on that wave of women making it into executive positions because of the Navy. And uh, the Bank of New York would send me out to talk about different things, you know, on panels, like at schools and everything else. Well, I'd end up talking about the Navy more than I would about banking. My executive officer said, Rose, next time we send you out, would you mind just mentioning the Bank of New York or <laughs> banking instead of the Navy? 
So it was really wonderful. Um, I encourage young people to come in and serve their country all the time because I think we need to have that. Uh, it makes you appreciate what you have at home. From that, I, I went, when I went into the service, I traveled all over. I had never been out of Indianapolis, Indiana. By the time I finished, I had been in every state except Alaska, and I hope one of these days I can get up there also. Uh, San Francisco was wonderful. Um, I was the only woman in the fifth fleet. Now, as a single woman, that's a uh, pretty good odds. You know, I think there was a 50,000 man of me. I never got aboard ship, but I was in charge of the supply center uh, data processing where we, based on uh, the schedule of the ship and how many hours they were going to fly, um, reconnaissance and things like that, we would come up with how many boats they need, uh, uh, tubes, gas, and everything else from our computer system. Unfortunately, sometimes the computer system was off maybe an inch, and I later met a guy that was on one of the ships, and I just happened to mention that I was the one that helped supply the ship. And he gave me a look, he said, yeah, yeah. I think you had a problem with one of your programs because we didn't get enough gas to do whatever. So it was quite an experience. Bayonne, New Jersey um, was a naval supply center there. Um, because I was away and all of a sudden I, they found that I could bowl, as you'll probably see over there, I became the bowling wave of Bayonne, New Jersey. And um, I had the opportunity to uh, bowl in the All Navy, which I ran across my friend Diana Neely here, who is the first woman, who was the first woman to make warrant officer in the Navy, and I called her to congratulate her, and she came to live with me, and we've been together 40-some years. Um, but I'm hard of hearing, so I don't, I don't uh, listen to when she's yelling at me, okay? Um, other than that, in the reserves, it was a wonderful thing. I, again, got to go on a lot of uh, trips because we were the naval, uh, Floyd Bennett Field was an air station, and the Admiral there would be invited to go down to New Orleans, you know, to inspect on their annual inspection, and I got to go along too, and that was kind of neat. They'd roll out the red carpet, and I'd go marching down that. That was terrific. So my life in the Navy has been wonderful, and again, I recommend it. The only problem I had was the support of our country at the Vietnam War era, when they told us not to wear our uniforms when we were on liberty. It was a peace movement, I guess, and that really crushed me because I saw a lot of people going overseas that never came back. And I just, uh, you know, I worry about when we say um, we're against war, that's fine. But we should support the men and women that are dedicating their lives for freedom. Scatico, <clears throat> raised in Lansingburg, 
Lincoln Cohoes, Saratoga, Albany Colony, a few other places. But in, let's see, 1991, no, 92, I happened to be up in Glens Falls and met Thelma, Terry Waterston. And she and I have become close friends ever since. Even though I tease her because she was a Marine, uh, we don't like to go there. Well, one of the things I'm going to ask her is how they taught them how to put on their makeup. Because she and her daughter had two entirely different types of training when she went through basic training. And I know it was nothing like what I went through in basic training either. We were Army. Who are? Seven five. Hey. So I'm going to ask Terry to come up and tell you a little bit about herself and pass along her military history. And I hope she talks on the military side and not so much of what she does now as a civilian. Because it's hard to get her to talk about the military side of her life. Terry Waters. Thank you, Noni. Uh, I graduated from high school in 1954. I got a job at Ma Bell, Ohio Bell Telephone Company, proofreading the yellow pages. And that is about as exciting as watching water drip from a faucet. I handled about four months of that, and I saw a poster. I was down downtown Cleveland, and my older sister, 18 months, she and I were down there and saw this poster. It said, join the Marines, free a man to fight. This was during Korea. Well, that sounded pretty exciting to us, and we could actually get out to see the world. So we both decided to join the Marines. I was a little bit young for, uh, I needed my parents' consent to enlist. I thought I was going to have a hard time with my father until he met the five foot nine redheaded recruiting sergeant, and she was outstanding. <laughs> and he was a sucker for redheads, so of course he signed down the dotted line. And we were both off to basic training. Now, I did calisthenics in high school, and I was active in sports, and I thought, well, I could handle the Marine Corps. Well, it certainly wasn't high school. But Noni and my daughter tease me now. We did calisthenics in our little brown peanut suits, and we ran the obstacle course. But we were not able to weapons qualify like they did now. We went to the rifle range, and they detonated, assimilated atomic bomb blasts, etc. But we sat on the bleachers. We did go through the gas chamber, which everybody is quite familiar with. And we also had lessons in how to walk and how to properly behave as ladies and present ourselves to the public as Lady Marines. And we also learned how to take care of our hair and our makeup, which my daughter teases me about to this day. But we that was what we were trained for. Our, we, we, the majority of us went into a office position. My sister went to the motor pool, and since I had already had clerical training, I wound up at Camp Elmore at Norfolk, Virginia, working um, at typing secret and confidential dispatches. And since my sister didn't have any training in typing, she wound up in the motor pool, and she liked her job. And I enjoyed mine. Uh, I was transferred from there to Headquarters Marine Corps and worked at the Naval Gun Factory at the Marine Corps Institute, enrolling in students. Uh, I loved Washington, the history. And the Naval Gun Factory is where the Commandant of the Marine Corps lives. So every, we would be bused to Noon Chow to the old barracks and have a family style lunch 
And I, I remember walking under the porticos to go into the chow hall. And the stairs leading into the, that, that building was stone. And from thousands of people going up these two stairs, there was an actual groove from their feet shuffling those two stairs to go into the building. I met my first husband there. He was a career Marine. Uh, we had a wonderful seven years together, and we had been gone to uh, Camp Lejeune and also to Quantico. Uh, he was a uh, drill instructor, officer candidates. He was sent on classified duty and returned uh, prior to the Vietnam War. He had been in special ops and returned and unfortunately passed away at a very young age of 29. So my young son and I returned from Great Lakes Naval Hospital where he had passed away and returned to Quantico because we really loved the area. Now, I am out of the military now, but I never did get out of the military because that saying about being once a Marine, always a Marine, it's instilled in you. And I don't care what branch of the service you are in, you learn independence, uh, you learn to be self-sufficient, and I think you stand a little bit taller. And you think less of yourself and more of other people. And I did remarry in 65, Pamela's father, and we had three wonderful children that served, and I became very involved in the Ladies Auxiliary. For 33 years I've been an auxiliary member. I know none of you said not to talk about that, but I am I'm still involved in the military because the auxiliary, we would go down to the VA hospital and purchase help the uh, patients down there select gifts for their families. I was involved in the uh, hockey game, uh, the Veterans Night at the Civic Center, and they would collect items for the veterans uh, down at the VA hospital, toiletry items. And so I worked on that for about 10 years. Um, I've been an 18-year veteran of, or a, a member of the Legion. Uh, they weren't overly keen on having a woman in the Legion. Some of the men were, you know, this is a man's territory. And I said, well, I think I can be a part of this and I can help. Within three years, I became a commander. And I worked hard, and I said, work with me, and, and we'll have a great organization, which they did. And I went on from there to become a county commander. And when I was, a I became, I was Legionnaire of the Year on a post level, and I became Legionnaire of the Year on a county level, and fourth district level. And I was very proud to go up to Syracuse to be a part of the seven Legionnaires that were up for the state award. I did not make it, but it was such a proud moment for me in Syracuse to just be a part of knowing that I had been selected by my peers, mostly male, 99 Legion posts select like me for the fourth district. And that in itself was a wonderful, wonderful honor. And I have worked since then, especially harder since my daughter Pam went into the Army and became part of Desert Shield, Desert Storm, Desert Victory. I became a part of the Operation Uplift to send packages through the uh, Naval Reserve, or I'm sorry, the New York State Army National Guard, and we said, boxes and boxes of things to our troops over in Saudi Arabia. I became um, a spokesperson to our 
schools in the area for patriotism and flag etiquette. I used Sergeant Fortune's book on Mom Wears Combat Boots. Um, this, by the way, she dedicated this book to uh, my daughter who followed in my footsteps. And so I found myself in front of kindergarten children and uh, primary grades reading this book and showing the flag etiquette newsreel, or uh, videotape, I'm sorry, from the American Legion. And I remember the first time I went to this kindergarten class and all these little children are sitting in front of me. And this, I said, well, I'll finish and then we'll answer, have a question and answer game. So this little girl's hand kept bopping up, popping up. And finally I got all through and I said, yes, dear, what would you like? And she said, can I go to the bathroom? <laughs> so uh, I, I went to my granddaughter's class at Big Cross High School in Glens Falls and spoke to them. And I was very happy to be asked to coordinate the Armed Forces Museum at the historical site, Teddy Roosevelt's train depot in North Creek. That opened last fall. They are reopening it next weekend, and they've extended it to an exhibit of the 10th Mountain Division. So it, it will be open from 10 to 4 every Tuesday through Sunday, starting May 3rd. And uh, anybody is welcome. It's a, it's a beautiful display, not, show, not only about Teddy Roosevelt, but also the Armed Forces and the 10th Mountain Division, which many of our men from North Creek and the outlying areas were in that division. Um, ah, yes, but not least. Uh, for 12 years, I have coordinated the POW MIA service on top of Prospect Mountain. And this is the 35th year that this stone has been from the original uh, date of dedication. And we extend the invitation to the 3rd and 4th District and any unit that would like to parade and show their colors on Prospect Mountain our guest speaker, I'm very happy to say this year, is John Edwards. He has agreed to speak with us and um, get his message on his years that he was in and his time when he was a POW. We will have a uh, the former New York State former ex-POWs will lay the wreath at the stone. And this is open to the public. I have flyers over on the table here. It's at the 1st of June. It's a Sunday at 1 o'clock. It's a 40-minute program. If you wish, you can. It's at the summit of Prospect Mountain. Bring your lawn chair. Um, following the service, you are welcome to come back to the dugout, Lake George Post on American Legion Drive, for refreshments and free entertainment. And I guess that's what I'm involved in right now. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. And yes, by all means, Prospect Mountain. What's the date again? The 1st of June. 1st of June. Come on up. Let us remember those who...